Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I should actually have threatened with that. If we don't come to attention, I'll start singing, which will just clear the room out immediately. Uh, I am the, uh, the MC for the morning. I am Pastor Greg Briggs. I am the interim pastor up at First Congregational Church, Grand Ledge, Michigan, which is just outside of Lansing. So if you don't believe that ICPJ is truly an inclusive organization, they invited somebody from Lansing to come to Ann Arbor. For this and you can throw things at me later. That's fine. Um, we're going to start a couple of minutes late. I'm sure some of you got caught in the, uh, the traffic that was going on. Um, and so we're glad that you're here as people continue to filter in. For those that are just coming to the tables, please you know, help them find coffee, help them find Danish, or whatever we have at the table. I actually haven't had a chance to look at the spread yet. Um, I want to take just a quick moment to thank everyone that helped make this organiz this uh, event possible. So I want to say thank you to the table captains, I want to say thank you to the organizing committee, and thank you to Ann Arbor Christian Reformed Church for hosting us today. So if we get a quick round of applause for them. And now I would like to introduce Reverend Haju Sunin. Did I say it right? Uh, she has been a student of Samu. Haju Sunim has been a student of Samu Sunim since she first showed up on a motorcycle for a full, full morning meditation sitting in Toronto, Canada in 1976. Since that time, she has dedicated her life to the Dharma, most recently as the resident priest for the Ann Arbor Zen Buddhist Temple in Michigan. And so, with no further ado. Dear brothers and sisters, teachers, friends, so wonderful to see everyone here today. I thought there would only be about five or six of us. <laughs> really wonderful. The ancient order of protocol sets gratitude as the highest priority. So first, gratitude to our Mother Earth, to the sun, to the moon, waters, trees, winds, plants and more, and now though to the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice, for real leadership in social action and skillful means for more than 20, 50 years, right? Yeah. And for each of you for just turning up here this morning in the spirit of the mission of the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice. Many blessings to each of you and to your activist and spunky spirit, <laughs> much needed these days. I'd like to share with you very briefly um, something that I came across many years ago uh, before I was about to lead a meditation retreat. And it was a story from a Zen master from our Korean Buddhist tradition by the name of Chino. And the lines were, it is more important to eat one meal with full attention than to save 150,000 people. And I thought that was a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> but I decided since the retreat was coming up and we would eat silent meals, that I should see what it was about and to be fully present with eating. And over the years, I've tried to do that and come up with a lot of answers. One is, and you may find it today, that every time we eat, it becomes us, the food. Sometimes we forget that. There are many other insights that can come in terms of interrelationship, wisdom, things that are obvious. So I ask you as you eat, at least, I know we're going to be hearing talk, so you won't be able to be in silence, deeply contemplating your food. But for the first couple of minutes, and then when you have a chance to eat, to contemplate that. What's it about that's so important about eating food? So here's the blessing that we use at the temple, and I'll ask you to repeat after me. Bringing your hands reverently together, Palm to palm. It's called the Hup Chung of Sincere Heart. This food, please repeat, this food is a gift 
of the whole universe. It is a gift of the whole universe. From this, from this, our body mind is nourished. Our body mind is nourished. Our practice sustained. Our practice sustained. Gratefully, we accept this meal. Gratefully, we accept this meal. And then we make a uh, of appreciation for our food. And if, could we have one minute of silence before the rest of the talking comes? Half a minute of silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So please in, enjoy this meal coming from the 10 directions. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't bring the bell. So <laughs> joy being the person who gets to interrupt such wonderful conversation as well as your enjoyment of your meal. But I need to just for a moment uh, move us along in the program. My name is, uh, I'm the Reverend Donnell White. I'm the senior pastor of the Vineyard of uh, Vineyard Church of Ann Arbor, but I'm also the uh, president of the board of the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the board and myself. Like you all, I uh, joined or learned about uh, Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice at a breakfast, albeit a different breakfast, uh, where I got to meet our executive director, Chuck, as the uh, ICPJ was introducing and working on uh, bringing the race project here uh, to the University of Michigan and connecting with clergy to let us know about the program. From there, I connected with uh, ICPJ by joining the board and learning about some of the incredible work that we're doing for the issues of peace and justice, and in particular, the issues around uh, racial economic justice. And so I have uh, dedicated my time, my energy, and my money to the work that we are doing to uh, reform policing in particular. That's one of the issues that uh, is close to my heart and that our organization is working on with other people like the Washtenaw Faith Leaders Forum to bring the issues that are happening outside of our community present here so that we don't have the same types of issues that we're seeing in our country happen here in Washtenaw County. And I didn't realize that ICPJ was the organization that could bring together all of those people. I didn't know that ICPJ would be the organization that would lead the way. But I am grateful that I found out about the organization. And I am grateful that each of you are here today. And so what we'd like to do now is just show you a short video about some of the work that we're up to here in the county and for the common good and for the issues of peace and justice. because it's already strong. We want this world. But to shape and sustain it, we need a culture of care and accountability, of peace and justice, grounded in an enduring respect for human life and dignity. We believe that by nurturing compassion, we can better care for those around us. And by working with local communities to build transparency, we ensure greater accountability for the transformative change we are working toward. This is the responsibility we all bear toward one another. This is our human responsibility. These are our human 
rights. For over 50 years, ICPJ has worked with people of diverse faiths and backgrounds to act on their shared values for the common good. Our work is centered on affirming the human rights of all people and ensuring that each receives the dignity, freedom, care, and opportunities that are their due, regardless of someone's identity or background. To that end, we engage. Recently, ICBJ hosted an inaugural summit called Connect and Act, building the new movement for economic and racial justice. We used this summit to focus on issues of racial and economic justice. Through it, we connected many communities in the area working to build relationships and create long-term sustainable change. We know that Washtenaw County is not immune to the mistrust which has shattered the relationship between law enforcement and communities across the country. But we also believe that the best way to protect lives is to cultivate mutual understanding and accountability. To that end, ICPJ has worked closely with faith leaders and policy advocacy groups to grow positive connections with law enforcement. And we continue to develop leadership and build capacity by training citizen teams throughout the county to work with local departments. We recognize that the burden of keeping our community safe doesn't rest on law enforcement alone. It begins with a mindset that is open to changing behavior and eventually changing systems. That's what one human family means. Seeing our community with fresh eyes as an intentionally diverse and inclusive set of relationships unified by the personal commitment we each make to protect one another's human rights. We believe in finding ways to de-escalate confrontations, to protect those who are vulnerable, and to increase communication with those who hold opposing viewpoints. Our bystander intervention training program has given many members of our community a toolkit for understanding how to resolve conflicts in a nonviolent way. And then, with a mindset of collaboration, build rich connections as one human family. But most importantly, we are here for you to empower individuals and communities alike, to build capacity and develop leadership. From skills building grassroots organizing to issues-based education, our programming is designed to help you take the next steps in becoming a more empowered social justice advocate. Through the efforts of our members, we made it possible for over 200 people from Washington County to attend the Women's March in Washington, D.C., where they joined the 5 million people of conscience who marched worldwide in advocacy of human issues of gender and identity, immigration and health care reform, protection of the environment, racial equality, freedom of religion, and workers' rights. For many, this event has inspired a new and renewed commitment to join with others on a larger stage and to return to engage in new ways at home. This is the work of peace and justice we do in our community, in our world. With care and accountability, we can protect the human rights of everyone. We are better together. Be a part of this critical work. Please, show your support today. Invite up our next speaker. Uh, her name is Maria Wunsch. She is a member of ICPJ. She is also the wife of Donnell. Um, I'm not sure why I'm introducing her versus him. Uh, we offer premarital counseling at my church. Counseling. Um, but as I understand that she became engaged with uh, ICPJ on her own right through Connect and Act. So please come up and tell us more. Discouraged and hopeless 
when faced with powers like school to prison pipeline, economic inequality, mass incarceration, xenophobia, the list goes on and on. About a year ago, I got connected with ICPJ through their conference called Connect and Act. I was amazed to find that these very issues were being tackled by a diverse group of people in our community that were coming together. In one of the workshops I heard a teacher from the Milan prison talk about how she had been transformed by seeing the humanity in the other in the prisons. I thought, I want that to be my story. Clink. I felt my first ripple of hope as I teared up in that workshop. When I got home, I sifted through all of the flyers that I had gotten from the workshop. <laughs> Clean water, fair housing, books. I read a little blurb about Children's Literacy Network, who were working to promote literacy and a love of reading for all the kids in Washtenaw County. They even had a program called Staying in Closer Touch that connected children with their parents through reading to their children and the recording and a handmade card and a book going to their children, interrupting the school to prison pipeline. I had to know more. So I emailed the contact that sure. I emailed the contact that was on that flyer. And six months later, with my mom and best friend, I found myself inside the prison walls recording dads to their children. Staying in closer touch has made a profound difference in my life and in the life of a girl named Nigel. Nigel's a teenage girl who was able to improve her Spanish through hearing her dad read bilingual books to her. And she got those books and the recording and she was so excited that she went and took those to her Spanish class to share with everybody. <laughs> Nolan was also empowered through this program because he decided that no matter what it took, he was going to stay close to his daughter. So when he was first locked up, Nolan, his daughter was really young, and he thought, I just can't be a dad from within here. But with the encouragement of his counselor and through dogged determination, he decided to send hand-painted ceramics, books, cards, and called his daughter regularly. Staying in closer touch was yet another avenue for him to connect with her. And he said, you know what? I'm probably the closest with her out of our whole family. This is one of many stories that have brought ways of change to the life of a dad, a child, and me. Let me share one last little wave of change with you this morning. Remember how when I sat in that workshop, I said, I want that to be my story? About a month ago, I found myself on the very same stage that I had seen the woman who was in the prison. And about a week later, and I was sharing my story, about a week later, a woman named Jacqueline came up to me and said, you know what? I want to enter staying in closer touch into a first fruits giveaway at my work, this year. And this week, I had the privilege of hearing from Disher how they want to make a positive difference in the world, and they give the director of Children's Literacy Network a $4,000 check. Our little ripples of hope were overlapping. Just thinking about the 400 books that that money could buy, and the hundreds of kids, dads, and volunteers that would be impacted definitely showed me that a tiny ripple of hope sure can bring waves of change. For me, being a member of Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice has been like becoming part of that wave of change. Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice drew me in because I saw that everyone was welcome and everyone had something to contribute. Each one of you here today has a tiny ripple of change story. ICBJ has been bringing people like us together for over 50 years. That means that longer than some of us have been alive, ICBJ has been bringing people together to make opportunities for them and to have us interact with other change makers to make a larger wave of change. This is called constructive interference. So this morning I want to invite you to ask your table mates 
what passions they have related to peace and justice. Maybe you can exchange contact information. Because I, I am totally convinced that together, when our ripples overlap, we can be part of waves of change. We can wash over all of the hate and injustice that we see around us to bring peace to our neighborhoods, to bring justice to our cities, and to bring freedom and justice for all in our land. We are better together. And ICPJ is one of the only organizations around that has a proven history of being able to bring people together across their differences. Connect and Act was my introduction to ICPJ, and I was blown away that this small but mighty nonprofit organization was able to pull off such a powerful event. And also, that one year later, I can say that it changed my life, and most certainly hundreds of others. I look forward to making waves of change with you. Thank you. And now I have the privilege of introducing Saima Assad. Saima Assad has lived in Ann Arbor since 2006 and has been part of ICBJ since 2010. Saima has also served on several One Human Family committees. She's also a trainer for the Bystander Intervention Program. Please help me welcome Saima. email alerts that have been coming into my inbox these days. These are last week's alerts. I hope you can read them in the back. <laughs> Emails like this fill my inbox every day and they frighten me. They are pointing to a place I've seen before and had hoped would not be our reality in the United States. I'd like to tell you a story today about two cities. The city of my birth, Karachi, Pakistan, and the city I now call home, Ann Arbor, Michigan. To start with, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the research of Ashutosh Vashni of Brown University. He has done this research in India. He found that at times of inter-religious tension, those cities in India which had created networks of engagement between different religious communities remain calm while other cities that hadn't made an effort to build those networks between communities exploded into civil war. This has also been my experience. My city of birth, Karachi, is a large port in Pakistan. It is the biggest city in the Muslim world and the seventh biggest city in the world. Its population reaches 23 million. 90% of the population of Karachi are immigrants. Karachi was built in the early 1900s by the British. Soon, business families from all over India arrived and settled here. British companies moved here. As ships started docking, Anglo-Indians, Chinese, and Goans arrived. When Pakistan was made in 1947, many refugees from all over India arrived here, and they found Karachi to be a safe haven for them. Rural to urban immigration from all the states of Pakistan has further swelled the population over time. Since people in different regions of Pakistan and India speak different languages, Karachi became a happy mix of regional and international languages, ethnicities and religions as diverse as Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, Sikhism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism and others. My most favorite memory of the Karachi of my childhood is of the tea houses that existed in the business districts. Situated on broad, tree-lined, busy streets in the center of the city, housed in gracious buildings of the colonial era, these tea houses seemed to stay open half the night, and all the diverse communities that made up Karachi's business classes could be found drinking tea and engaging in business talk with each other. One would always make time to enjoy a cup of tea and relax. 
However, troubled waters soon reached our shores and this state of peace was broken. In 1977, martial law was declared in Pakistan by General Zia. Our civil liberties and freedoms were now at an end. People accused General Zia of having used the old British principle of divide and rule to stay in power. General Ziaullah ruled for 10 long years from 1977 to 1988. He was Pakistan's longest serving head of state. During his time, we saw a lot of religious strife. The government didn't directly persecute the minorities, it didn't have to. All it had to do is to make policies that value one set of citizens over another. He changed the way we look at each other. We found ourselves noticing our differences rather than our commonalities. Soon microaggression started. People were rude to one another. Inter-religious tensions built up. Zia had our religion entered into our identity cards and also on our passports. Also, sharp ethnic and political differences emerged during his time. My city in particular was hit by the worst kind of ethnic strife. Suddenly it became important what language you spoke and where you were from. You were judged and preferred, or not, for jobs and other economic opportunities. Horrendous ethnic clashes followed. Soon the entire fabric of society was torn apart and no one was safe. Businesses flew away, joblessness increased, frustration increased. Many individuals resisted the government's policies at great personal perils, as also did many NGOs and civic organizations. They were not successful. Many leaders, writers, journalists were jailed. This guy is Habib Jali, he's a poet. He wrote against Zia, so. Perhaps the most far-reaching damage that was done in Zia's time was that our very ideology and definition of ourselves was changed. Social studies and history textbooks were changed. A whole new generation came up that doesn't remember what things were like before. Zia has been dead 30 years, but ethnic and religious strife in my city has grown greater and greater, and life has become unbearable, even for the majority, and certainly for the minorities. We lost our democracy, and we lost ourselves. Now, after losing so much, the citizens of Karachi have awakened to an important realization that interfaith and peace organizations are vital to their very survival. Some organizations have been formed. The last slides show interfaith activists standing outside cathedrals, forming a human chain to protect Christians in 2013. Unfortunately, the tea houses don't exist in the business districts anymore. You can go ahead with the next slide. There was too much trouble on the streets for the, tree ha for the tea houses and cafes to survive in the business districts. They went out of business long ago. They were torn down. Those who sip tea in them are gone too. I can never show my kids what it used to be like in Karachi, but in an hour you can save your tea houses and cafes. You have the opportunity to notice your commonalities, to bring people together before it is too late. Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice has been building bridges for many decades. Go to the last slide. They realize the importance of relationship and that we, as a people, are better together. We need ICPJ right now, maybe even more than we know. It is not too late. I urge you all to support these bridges now, so they will be strong to withstand troubled times. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saima, for sharing your story. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Danal. Thank you, Greg. And thank you all for being here this morning.
My name is Chuck Warpa Husky. I serve as the Director of Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice. And I want to take us back six months to right around the time of the election. Remember how that felt? <laughs> and I'm not talking necessarily about who won or lost. I'm talking about all the other things that started happening all that time when we started seeing, and started advancing, started seeing the attacks on uh, Muslims. We started seeing the attacks at a higher level on immigrants, on people who are Jewish, on uh, people of color. The, these things weren't new, but they got turned up so much. Remember how that felt? I remember talking to a friend of mine, a woman came into the office, a Puerto Rican woman, and she was so afraid of the anti-immigrant sentiment, she started carrying her U.S. passport on the outside, hidden to the outside of her clothes, because she was terrified that she was going to get targeted for harassment, or that people were going to try to get her deported, even though she's a U.S. citizen. She's still afraid. I remember talking to a friend of mine who recently, uh, after a long period of homelessness, uh, found housing. And he was terrified he was going to lose his housing. And he battles with depression, so he's worried he was going to lose his health care. He's still afraid. I remember hearing so many stories from people in the Muslim community who felt so terrified and, and frightened by the attacks that were being leveled against them and feeling betrayed that their country and their community had turned against them. And many of them are still afraid. And of course, this wasn't new, right? Homelessness wasn't new. Anti-immigrant sentiments aren't new. Islamophobia isn't new. Racism aren't new. But the tension's been turned up in the last six months or years. Also, from people who weren't in those vulnerable communities, I've heard people coming to me. I remember talking to one woman, a mother, and she said, you know what? I realized all my kids' friends are white. I've got this commitment to being, to equity and inclusion and justice, but we're not living it out. We need to be doing better. In these times of division, we need to be doing better. We're better together. And so she came to ICPJ. She came to ICPJ because over the last 50 years, we've built up an experience and networks and the skills needed to bring people together across their differences to make a difference. Now, um, I could, be, I could tell you lots of stories about the work we're doing. You've heard a few of them this morning. You've heard a few of them in the video. I could talk to you about those little cards that are in your centerpieces and the work we're doing with Ryan McKendry and Ruth Cassidy and helping faith communities support immigrants facing the threat of deportation. I could tell you amazing stories about the work we're doing with Rev, uh, Reverend uh, Dan Elwich and the Faith Leaders Forum on addressing issues of race and policing. There are so many fantastic stories about ICPJ's work I could share with you this morning. But we promised to get you out at night. So I'm going <laughs> to just focus on one part of our work, the Muslim and Family Campaign. Now you've seen some of the signs and banners around town. Um, so you can scroll back to, yep, thank you. Some of the signs and banners around town, that's the pub public face of the campaign. And I've had people ask me, does this make a difference? And I can tell you it does. I know it does because I hear stories like this. Uh, if we can go back to the, back to the, the yard sign, please. OK. Um, this little note here that was pinned to that, that was a note from a young girl, Yassine, who she wrote that she's from a Muslim family. This was about a year ago. And she pinned a note, a thank you note, and a flower on somebody's yard sign. Because in this time when she and her family felt so attacked, it meant so much to her that somebody had taken the effort to say, you're here, you're welcome, we care about you. Mm -hmm. Or I heard a story, there's a bigger picture of the sign. We also heard a story, a woman named Michelle shared the story the day after the election. She had her one human family art sign out, and she wasn't, she was feeling, uh, she wasn't in the mood for cooking, so she ordered pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and when that knock on the door came from the pizza delivery driver, she opened the door, and the woman she met was wearing the job. And she was crying. The pizza delivery driver said, thank you so much for your sign. It means so much on a daily today. They hugged, and Michelle said, she's not normally in the habit of hugging her pizza delivery driver. <laughs> she said, I've got your back. And they had to do that sort of awkward, OK, now, now how do we pay for the pizza transition? <laughs> but it made a difference for that driver. It made a difference for Michelle. It made a difference for all the people who were in that store. Now this is. 
the public side of the story, but there's also other things that are part of the One Human Family campaign. You heard the discussion of the bystander intervention trainings come through in a couple of things. We've all seen these stories, the headlines of the, some of the terrible things that have happened, people getting assaulted on the subway, getting ha hassled in the line at the bank. And we, have you ever asked yourself, what would I do if I were there? What could I do if I were there? Well, the good news is that there are things you can do. There are tools and techniques that you can use to intervene in situations like this. And you'll be more effective if you learn them and practice them. So we, set, we worked with our friends and networks, uh, people like MetaPC, to develop a bystander intervention training to give people the skills and the abilities to, to respond to comments, whether it's somebody getting hassled uh, at, at the bus stop or the inappropriate comment at the workplace uh, lunch table. And these have had an impact. The day after one of our trainings, a woman wrote back to us and said, thank you so much. The day after my training, I went to the fabric store. And I was talking to a woman, and she made a disparaging remark about immigrants and refugees. And before that training, I would have just been quiet and seethed about it. But because I'd learned the skills, I had been able to engage in a kind tone, an engaging tone, and make a difference, to turn the tide on the conversation to one of inclusion. Our work makes a difference. I hear the stories every day. And it's fantastic, it's beautiful, it's a blessing to hear these stories. But it's also, I'll be honest, it can be frustrating. Because I see how much more need there is. How much more need there is to do the work that Simon was talking about, about building those relationships across difference. We've had hundreds of people go through our bystander intervention trainings. It's been incredible. We should be having thousands. There are so much more that we could do if we just had the resources, if we just had the ability to do it. So I want to thank you all for sharing your morning with us today, for learning about ICPJ's work, and for the work that we can do together to build those bridges of understanding, those bridges of relationship, and work together, because we are better together. up Joel and Yara. Joel has a long time, has long time family connections to ICBJ. Yara is somebody whose personal story is deeply in time with the mission of the work, and they will be closing this up for this month. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Joel Applekraut, and I'm a senior at Community High School. I'm also the son of Michael Apple and Rich Kraut, who some of you may know. Um, they've been long, like heavily involved in SCPJ for a long time. So for a young age, um, from a young age, I was taught the values that this organization was long stood for. Um, this past school year, the father of my classmate was detained by ICE during a routine check-in um, with immigration officers. And as a writer for my school newspaper, The Communicator, I saw a necessity to expose this injustice to the world and to keep a family and our community together. So I'd like to invite Yara Ajini, my friend, to tell her family story for you today. Yara, yeah, it's going to be hard for them to hear it in the back unless you speak right next to it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, January 30th, my dad went in for his normal bi-weekly check-in with ICE, and the week before he got a call from them that he thought was another scam, which lots of immigrants get. So, of course, he got angry and told them not to call back. My dad never thought for a second that this phone call could have had the chance to change our family's lives forever. January 30th, my father was detained and held in Calhoun County Jail for a whole month. The day I found out, my cousin, Asil, and my sister, Batul, picked me up from school and said, guess what? Right away, I said, is my dad getting deported? As a joke, but they both said in unison, how did you know? Reality set in, and I felt a rush of heat all over my body. Is this really happening? Towards the beginning of this long month without my father is when my family really struggled the most financially and emotionally. I think it was hardest for my younger, younger siblings because they were just thinking the obvious, my dad is gone. Instead of looking at it with the facts all lined up. The fact was that my father had, had really been arrested for no reason at all, except for a phone call. So I had the feeling since the beginning that, this was, that he was gonna be home. 
but there was also a chance that I could be wrong thanks to the new president's decisions on immigration. Straight from day one, Community High School has been by our side, especially Dean Marcy and Quinn Strassel. They set up a fundraiser to help my family, and to be honest, I didn't expect it to get so much attention. Their support not only helped us financially, but emotionally as well. Joel wrote an amazing article to put in the communicator, and the article went viral. And from that point on, we had lots of media attention. From Ann Arbor News to Channel 7, people from all over heard about our family, and thousands of letters of support started flooding into our emails and mailboxes. The love and support we got from people in and around our community was honestly life-changing. My, fa my family didn't have to worry about not being whole anymore. My aunt said, the day we got Yusuf, ho Yusuf home, we didn't see the people standing outside as black, white, brown, Muslim, or Christian. We were all just humans trying to strengthen humanity. This frightening experience was probably the best thing that has happened to me and many people I know. It opened our eyes and showed us what Ann the Ann Arbor community was really about and what we could all do to help. On this Tuesday, the 16th, I went to a rally to help the family of Jose Luis Sanchez Ron Julio. And even though we were there for something as scary as losing another great member of our society, everyone there, including the family, had a smile on their face. And the louder the chants grew, the more our, the more our smiles grew. We could feel every single drop of love, and it feels so great to know that that's how people felt when they came to help out my family. The best way to help families going through a de this deportation crisis is to hide your fear within your fearlessness and your anger within your peacefulness. Now I'd like to invite Joel back up. <laughs> We shared this story with you guys today for a very specific reason and to showcase a very specific point. Everybody can do something to fight violence, prejudice, injustice, and discrimination in our, in our community. In fact, I would argue we all have a responsibility to resist these evils as they permeate through our society. Additionally, it's worth noting that stories of injustice do not just happen to nameless people we don't know. That each story involves a real person a real family, like Yara's, mine, or yours. ICPJ has worked for many years to help us all see the human faces of those harmed by unjust systems and policies, and to help empower us to do something about it. You have just heard a few stories today of people seizing an opportunity to promote peace and justice. So today, you all have an opportunity to do the same. When you agreed to join us this morning, you probably didn't come just to be asked for a financial contribution. You probably came today because a friend invited you or because you are already somewhat familiar with ICPJ and wanted to learn more. But now that you've heard the full ICPJ story and met some of the wonderful people whose lives have been impacted because of ICPJ, it's my privilege to ask you to make a financial investment to support this life-changing work. This is not just an investment in ICPJ, it truly is an investment in our community, an investment in our shared future. We have a unique opportunity through ICPJ to be co-creators of a more just and peaceful community, to be ripples of hope. And as you are seeing this morning, ICPJ ripples of hope reach far and wide. What an amazing investment opportunity. To build a stronger foundation to provide a stable future for ICPJ, we are asking you to consider making a multi-year pledge to ICPJ. If you have been inspired by what you've seen today, consider becoming a member of our community by making your tax-deductible donation to ICPJ today. Your support allows us to better plan for expanded programming and increased capacity to become more responsive to pressing social justice issues throughout Washington County. I'd like the table captains to pass up the pledge cards now. those of you who have already who already support ICPJ so could you please stand if you're a current ICPJ member and could everybody give them a quick round of applause for our ICPJ community? I want to thank you for your support and for making 
ICP days were possible. On the screen behind me um, and at your table, you'll find a description of different pledge levels meant to give you a sense of what your investment can do. Your tax deductible contribution will go toward the unrestricted oper operating funds of ICPJ. And our goal today is to raise $75,000 in pledges over the next five years. A pledge of $200 per year for five years is called our activist level. Your gift at this level could allow ICPJ to, for example, host five Washtenaw Congregational Sanctuary presentations or offer additional racial justice book group opportunities or develop an advanced bystander intervention training curriculum or a post-training follow-up program. A gift at this level is an average of just $17 per month. A pledge of $500 per year for five years is our advocate level. Your contribution at this level would cover, for example, training and supporting 10 citizen teams to work with local law enforcement agencies to address concerns of racial justice and policing in their communities. A giving level of $1,000 per year for five years is called our peacemaker level. This amount of support would allow ICPJ to offer, for example, 20 basic bystander intervention trainings for communities who would not otherwise be able to afford them. We know that some of you are a part of a community or foundation, or you may just be in a position to give more. The Changemaker Giving Level gives you a far-ranging impact on many social justice issues in our community and around the world. If you would consider a gift of $2,000 or more per, per year for five years, it would allow ICPJ to do more. We could accept additional individual internships, training the next generation of community organizers and social justice leaders. We could develop interfaith youth service and dialogue programs. We could invest in our future thanks to your support. If you are joining us today as a member making a multi-year pledge, let me offer my personal thanks for your generous support. <laughs> Although I started with the opportunity to show your support with a multi-year pledge, we know and respect that you may prefer to give at a different level, larger or smaller, and that option is available for you as well. There's a space on the forum to tell us how much you would like to give and for how long, and we thank you for your gift. Next, you'll see a box for payment information. We truly appreciate whatever level of support you can provide, and we ask that you make the first payment on your pledge today. If you'd like to make a credit card payment, you have a few options. You may write your card information on the pledge card. You may use your smartphone to go online and make a donation at www.icpj.org slash give. Or you can raise your hand and an ICPJ volunteer will come to your table with a PayPal reader and check your card right now. Like right now. I know that many of you are still writing, but if I could have your attention here for just a moment, it's very important that you hear what I'm about to say. Whatever gift you have chosen to make today, whether you have made a multi-year pledge, made a gift of a different schedule, or have given the gift of your valuable time to attend today, we sincerely thank each and every one of you. I'll give you some time now to finish filling out the cards, and when you are finished, please pass your envelopes back to your table captains. We greatly appreciate that you took time out of your busy lives to be here this morning to learn more about the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice. I'll turn it back to Greg to wrap up. Thank you. We're doing our best to get you out of here, as we promised, at 9 o'clock. But listening to Joel and Yara speak, it reminded me of the song Glory by Common and uh, John Legend. Particularly, there is one verse that I thought was really important. Um, Somewhere in the dream we had an epiphany. Now we right the wrongs in history. No one can win the war individually. It takes the wisdom of the elders and young people's energy. Welcome to the story we call victory. I think that's true, but I also think that we have to look at the wisdom of our youth and the energy of our elders as well. And so ICPJ for fi over 50 years has been tapping into all of that and more. And so thank you for your time here. Again, thank you for spending this. Am I forgetting anything? Thank you for Ann Arbor Christian. Again, thank you to Ann Arbor Christian Reform Church for hosting us. Uh, write those checks big and strong and proud. Uh, we have bouncers at the door. Uh, no, <laughs> so, thank you very much, and uh, good luck going to school. <laughs>